This is a mistake that anyone could make. This is an entirely reasonable mistake. The fact that the symptoms of the problem were so far removed, the fact that it took two weeks of quite literally around the clock, around the globe, kernel expertise. You, you as a customer never could have assembled the expertise that we were able to summon on that problem. And it was bone chilling that any customer could have that problem. And we realized that the sucking was a serious problem. And the ways that we had of resolving that were completely down the wrong path. Because all we would give you were these kind of bean counters, kind of happy or sad counters. I'm not a huge fan of happy or sad counters because usually if a counter is telling you you're sad, you're like, I know I'm sad. I wouldn't be looking at you if I weren't sad. I don't need to know that I'm sad. I need to know why I'm sad. And this idea of, of, custom, gen of custom generating modules to throw them on the machine was a non-starter. But why, were we, why was I having to do that? Why was, I having to, why was I having to custom generate modules? Because these modules were not written to debug every possible amount of information. Right? Look at the way we develop software. When, if, if you want to see software, how do you see it? You, put your, you add things to your code that say, if logging is enabled, or if debug is on, or if you want to see me, I'm going to syslog, or I'm going to store something to a ring buffer, or I'm, I'm going to emit some datum, right? And the problem is that that boils down to th that if conditional, conditionally emit datum, that boils down to a load, a compare, and a branch in terms of the microprocessor. And that costs. There's no way around that. And you can't possibly, moreover, anticipate every portion of your code that needs these. Right? And if your code were covered with these things, your code would be too slow to ship, even if they were not enabled. So we realized that we had to take a fundamentally different approach. And what we need to go do is be able to safely, dynamically instrument the system. And we needed to do that in such a way that we could, we could ask arbitrary questions about the system, gather arbitrary data. So one of the first things that we discovered in, in starting to develop D-Trace, so, so Mike Shapiro, Adam Leventhal, and I started to develop D-Trace, or Mike and I initially set out, we added Adam to the team about, about six months later, um, in the fall of 2001. And one of the first things we figured out was we need a programming language. Uh, and if you've, if, I, I assume many of you have either, if you've obviously heard of D-Trace, so you've seen D-Trace demo or, or what have you, um, I won't actually, well, maybe I will actually just show you what it looks like. Fortunately, I've got a, um, th this is my Mac. Um, it's uh, enormously liberating that I can show you D-Trace on a platform that I did not develop myself. Um, so if I just run D-Trace without any arguments, I see this kind of uh, Unixy style help message, which is normally fits within the 80 columns that God intended, but is only wrapping so you can see the font. I want to make that absolutely clear, that I think, I, I feel like I and perhaps we in this room are the last on the planet to defend God's intent of 80 columns. But I will defend it to the death. I want you to know that. Um, the, it, it was heartbreaking to me when a fellow engineer, who will remain nameless because it's just too heartbreaking to name him, um, started using one of, those, one of those newfangled male clients. Not Mutt, thank you very much. And I would still be using Elm if Elm could, God damn it, if Elm were actually compiled large file aware, I would still be using Elm. I would be one of the Elm dead enders. But anyway. Um, started sending me mail with embedded control M's in it. So my, my mail reader, of course, is embedding all of these horrific carriage returns that make it impossible to actually read his mail. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's really, it's pretty sad. Anyway, 80 columns are death. Um, so th this is 80 columns. You just can't quite appreciate it here. Um, if I wanted to, uh, to actually enable some probes, let's, I'm just going to, um, we'll do every uh, system call. And we'll just let, uh, we'll actually just trace the exact name. Let's do that. So the, the programming language aspect of D-Trace, I hope people can see that. Maybe you can't. Can, can folks see that in the back? OK, great. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the programming language aspect of this is that you want to attach arbitrary expressions. And, and this presentation is not meant to be an introduction to D-Trace, so I, I'm just going to kind of fly through this. But the, the, uh, this is, is the kind of the arbitrariness here, the arbitrary expression, which is a critical, critical observation in D-Trace. The, the fact that we, uh, and, and again, it wasn't that we made this, this observation in the abstract. It's that we realized we needed this when we went to go use this thing to actually solve real problems. So if I, if I just run that, for example, what I'm going to see is as every system calls, is executed, um, I can see who is doing what, and of course it's all dtrace and terminal. <laughs> um, which brings us to a very important 
uh, second observation from Dtrace that, again, was not reasoned about a priori, but rather figured out as we, as we started to, to implement it and started to use it to, uh, to actually solve real problems. So what we see here is uh, Dtrace and terminal, terminal being Apple's terminal here. So we see some selects, reads from terminal, writes from Dtrace, and so on. So what are we seeing here, of course? We're seeing all the system calls involved in writing all this crap out to the screen, right? We're seeing ourselves. And if you were to do the traditional Unix thing of, you know, Dtrace, pipe to cut, pipe to, pipe to sort, pipe to unique minus C, pipe to sort minus N, and so on, you come to the conclusion, like, hey, I, I, good news, I figured out what was going on with the laptop. Dtrace was murdering the laptop, <laughs> right? Um, and of course, that's the wrong conclusion. Uh, this is an example of what I would call, and I, I don't know if Bill's in the room or not, but <clears throat> it's what I call the top problem, right? You run top, what's the top process? Top. It's like, good news, man, I found the problem. I'm the problem! Or as actually one admin says, no, no, we run top, and the top seven processes are seven different tops from seven different admins logged into the box trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Um, which is probably more apt. Uh, and the reason, by the way, the top suffers from this problem, the reason you would see this here, so the same, same issue, is that you, the, the amount of work that you're doing is scaling with the amount of data, right? The amount of work the top has to do scales with the number of processes. You've got 8,000 processes in the box, top has to do 2x the work if you just had 4,000 processes, right? Of course, the day that you want to understand what the hell's going on in the box, you're more likely to have 8,000 or 4,000. More likely to have 8,000. So when you most need top, it is most likely to consume more of your CPU, which is a problem, not, not to denigrate top at all. But I guess it worked out that way. Um, so we, we did not want, we realized in, in, in Dtrace that we, we, we wanted to get out from underneath this problem. Actually, that, that's an overly romantic way of expressing it. I'm actually, th this, this implies that, because that, uh, we kind of saw this problem a little bit after the fact. The, uh, the true genesis of aggregations in Dtrace, which is what I'm kind of leading up to, um, Actually, let me show them to you and then I'll, I'll explain the true genesis. So what we realized we needed to do in, in order to get out of this problem is we don't want to trace the exact name. What we want to do is aggregate on it with this at sign notation. And I'm going to take the aggregating action to count. When I run this now, I don't see any output. And what we're keeping in the kernel is just a little table of exact name and count. That's it. Even better, we're able to keep these, because we call these aggregating functions, these are functions in which you do not need to see the entire data stream in order to be able to derive the result. Median is not an aggregating function. Mode is not an aggregating function. However, doing a count, for example, is. Because, and why is that important? What I'm able to do is keep a, a table of these per CPU. And then I can aggregate them together in user land. The scales. Right, you don't have any, because one thing you do not want to have in any sort of instrumentation framework is contention on some global table to increment a, a variable, right? Because you will quickly become the problem. So if we control C that, we see what is a, and again, if this were only 80 columns, here, I, I'm actually considering making this smaller and then going to, uh, God is angry here. <laughs> I'm just feel it. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be punished later. I can, so I'm hoping you can still see this because I just, this just does not feel right. All right, there we go. Okay, order has been restored into the universe, and we can see the, what is truly going on in this box. Terminal and Dtrace are really not the issues, right? I've got a VMware image that's, that's crunching away that's definitely doing a lot more work than either of those guys, right? So that, that, that table is a much more concise answer. Now, I say that this is a, a, a bit of a, a revisionist history in terms of explaining how we developed aggregations, because the, the, the real truth of the matter is that, that aggregations were developed for a much more emotional reason. And that is, I told you about that lockstat utility that Bonwick developed. Um, I was hellbent on having the rare and unique pleasure of ripping out a bunch of Bonwick code. 